Hello, hello, hello. How are you guys doing today? Um, so it is currently, let's see, 6.44 p.m. on this absolutely beautiful Friday evening. It is like clear, clear skies. And I'm looking at the temperature right now. It is 91 degrees, sunny, feels like 91. Um, all of my neighbors at the pool said it's supposed to be like 93 or 94 tomorrow. Oh, 94 tomorrow. And partly cloudy skies, hot, high 94. So it's another day, it's gonna be really nice tomorrow. And then Sunday, 89, mainly sunny all day long. So we'll probably try to make it to the pool tomorrow and maybe even Sunday. I'm trying to go to the pool as much as possible, let me just tell you, okay? This is going to be the summer of the pool for me. And in fact, I just got back from the pool about a half an hour ago. I just posted um, my review video that I did for today, which is where I'm talking about TV shows. So go over there and check that out if you want to hear me talk about TV shows. All the TV shows I've been watching and what you guys want me to review. And then I did a Peterisms video, which was really great meditation today about setting limits and boundaries for, you know, like toxicity and people in your life and things like that. And then I did a Q&A on my drama channel because I had a bunch of questions that I hadn't answered when I did the Q&A the other day. So um, I filmed those videos, and then my plan was to get to the pool earlier today. I actually got quite a bit of sun today at the pool. I'm kind of surprised, because um, I didn't get up there till like 4.15. Alex got off work today about 2 and came home, and then he heated up some fried rice that he had um, left over from the other night when he and Sarah went to this Thai restaurant. They tried a new restaurant that she had gone to and like she went to introduce him to, and he was like, it's really, really good. He's like, it's out by your dad's house, so we'll have to try it out there sometime, and I was like, okay. So they went to this restaurant, and they really, really liked it. Um, so anyway, he had some fried rice that he had brought home, and he heated it up, and um, so I was like, well, do you want to go to the pool? And he was like, yeah, we can go to the pool. And um, I was like, well, I'm just trying to finish these videos up and whatever. So I was finishing the videos up and I didn't get them done until like four o'clock, four, four fifteen is when I went up to the pool. And so he was like laying in bed, like half asleep, looking at TikToks and stuff. And I went upstairs to put on my swimsuit and I said, do you want to go? Are you still wanting to go to the pool? And I kind of knew he'd probably say no. Alex doesn't like he's not <clears throat> somebody that loves to like go to the pool and like sit on the stairs or like be in the water. Like, like he likes to get in the water to be refreshed, you know, and cool down. But, like, if he's not laying out getting sun, he doesn't love to go to the pool. So, 4.15 was, like, way too late for him. So, I was like, do you want to go to the pool or do you want me to just go with the neighbor? Because the neighbor was going to the pool. And he was like, it's kind of late to go to the pool. And I was like, okay, I'll just go with the neighbor. So, went up to the pool with my neighbor. And, um... There were some other people up there uh, that, well, actually, this... So, this one girl that I know, this woman, um she and she used to bring her son to the pool and I hadn't seen them like in like two and since I didn't see them at all last summer so it's been like two years and her mom lives in this neighborhood and they all came to the pool and um so I was talking to them and then this other woman like her parents live in the neighborhood and so she had brought her daughter and uh this other kid like up there that like lives in the neighborhood or something that she knows like his parents or something like that and like they were like just like hanging out like the daughter and whatever the daughter was like complaining because her mom didn't get her tickets to the taylor swift concert she was being real sweet about it but her mom was like i spent three hours online trying to get her taylor swift concert tickets and i just couldn't get them like they were like every time i would get to the car like to check out like they would like something would happen to them she's like i tried so hard because i know she really wants to go to this concert the girl was very sweet she was like i said how old is your daughter and she's like she's 12 and she's like she wants nothing more than to go to this Taylor Swift concert. And I was like, oh, I can, I totally get that. We were actually talking, we were like, I said, I don't remember like anybody that I wanted to see that bad when I was growing up. And she was like, well, I do, Whitney Houston. I go, oh my God, that's so funny because I'm such a Whitney Houston fan. But anyway, so I talked to her for a long time and, um, cause the other people left. And so got to meet somebody new and then, um, oh my God, I literally, just before I started this, I ordered my Piata DoorDash, and it has already been picked up. Like, I ordered it at... Hey, how are you? Good, Peter, how are you? Good, where's the wife? Oh, she doesn't walk in the hot weather. Oh, gotcha, okay. Tell her I said hi. So it is now 6.48. I literally ordered it at 6.41 and it's already been picked up and it's on its way. I can't believe it. So I ordered the same pasta that I always get and I ordered an avocado sandwich. Um, I'm obsessed with these avocado sandwiches at Piata. 
Everybody asks me, they're like, what is Piata? Because like people like that don't live here don't know. Piata is, if you look on the website, it's P-I-A-D-A. -A, and um, it's Italian street food. But um, it just is kind of like, it's just all Italian food. But they have like these wrap sandwiches that are fantastic. Their pasta is really good too. For just, it's, I wouldn't necessarily call it fast food. I mean, it's not like Fazoli's. Um, it's more of like a Panera bread, if that kind of makes sense. But Italian food. But the pasta, I think, is really, really good. It's like angel hair, like pasta, and um, but you can get it like penne pasta as well. It says spaghetti, but it's like angel hair pasta, and I love it. But the, what I love is the sandwiches, the wraps. And so I got another avocado wrap sandwich. I got some pasta, and then I got an avocado ranch sandwich, or avocado ranch, avocado wrap sandwich, no pancetta, that's the bacon. But then I also got um, the street corn salad that they have, or street corn side, that has like uh, cherry tomatoes in it and stuff. And I'm really excited about that because I love street corn and I haven't tried it from there. So I was like, okay, this is something kind of new. And I'd ask Alex, um, I was like, do you want anything from Piata if I order it? Because we're going to watch RuPaul's Drag Race as soon as I get done vlogging. And he was like, no, because he had eaten the heated up uh, fried rice from the Thai place. And so he was like, no, I'm not hungry. But I got him a special Sunday. My husband loves chocolate chip cookies. And so I was looking on their desserts and they had chocolate chunk cookies and they're like really big. And so like not that big, but they're like this big. And so I got him a chocolate chunk cookie and I'm gonna surprise him with it. <laughs> Heat up the romanticals for the weekend, you know. The way to your husband's heart is through their stomach, if you didn't know. And I'm also drinking iced coffee uh, with my brand new Pride Cup that I got yesterday at Starbucks when we rolled through there. They have this in the window. I told Caroline, I said, we're going to have to go to, to Target next week because there's too, they had too many cups out there that were too beautiful. And I was like, I can't be buying two and three cups at the window. I got to actually like look at the cups and see. They had a pink one that I really want. That's like, a, it's like this, it's like disco, but it's all pink. Um, and I was like, I've got to look through my cups first to see if I like own cups that are too similar to this because I just start buying them like crazy. But this is the official 2023 Starbucks Pride Cup. I think it's really pretty. I love that it's kind of like different than the years before. I think I bought the Pride Cup like the last two or three years. And um, they're some of my favorite cups. So the, the one from last year is like all rainbow colors. And um, it's all like iridescent like this. Like the disc, this is called like the disco cup. It's so pretty. But anyway. So yeah, ordering my Piata. My Piata's coming. Went to the pool, talked to the neighbors. I actually, I went to the pool at like 4.15 and I got back about 6.00 maybe a little bit later than that. So I was at the pool a lot longer than I thought I would be. I just sat on the steps forever and just like talked to everybody. <laughs> it was so fun. I love talking to my neighbors. They're so nice. It's a good time. And then last night I finished watching the Curious Case of Natalia Grace, which is so weird. I just have to tell you guys the things. There's somebody in this documentary that I used to work with and I was like, when they came into the documentary, I was like, because their name is kind of different, and I was like, oh my god, like, I used to work with them. <laughs> like, for a couple years, worked with them. And, um, and I was like, this is really crazy. And, um, then my friend was texting me, and she was, she knows, um, the husband's new wife, the ex-husband's new wife, what does this say? She knows, um, the ex-husband's new wife or something like that. And so she was like, yeah, these are the people that I know. Remember I was telling you that they were filming the documentary. And I was like, oh yeah, you were telling me about that. And I said to her, I said, they're all crazy. And she's like, they are all totally crazy. I said, well, your friend seems nice in it. Cause like they don't really have her in a whole lot. But um, I was blown away. Like I still really, to be honest with you, I don't really know what to believe. Although by the end of it, just my gut response to it is, I feel really bad for this girl. Like I feel, I tend to believe, I mean there's no conclusive closure to the documentary really. I mean kind of, like you know some things that happen with the court trials and things like that, but like, I don't know. Like it just, th there's so many things that are very skeptical in it. 
I would highly recommend watching this documentary. It is a really, really good true crime documentary, especially if you're like, you like to watch the stuff that kind of unfolds as you're watching it and you have no clue where it's going. Like I had no clue where this documentary was going, none whatsoever. So I finished that last night. I had like two episodes, two and a half episodes that I watched. And um, then I, so then by that point it was like three o'clock in the morning and Manifest, which I thought was a new season of Manifest, I had forgotten that what it was, was part two of the fourth season, which I'm kind of excited about, I have to say, because I thought what they were doing was they were coming out with a new season and then they were gonna split it and it was gonna be, I don't know how I forgot this, but like, I think maybe it's because I was like confusing it with Fear of the Walking Dead, but I thought that like, so they were gonna show part of the season in June and then the rest of it in November. But what it is is they've already shown the first half of the season four and so like the first 10 episodes. And so they just released the last 10 episodes. So the rest of Manifest is out and do not ruin it for me. I'm gonna tell you right now in the comment section, okay, I will be so bitter. <laughs> you wanna see me go off, I'll be, I will go off because I watched the first episode, I watched episode 11 last night. So I have 12 through 20 or whatever still to watch. And, um, you know, it's so funny watching the show because the show is so incredibly corny. Like, the concept is very science fiction-y. I mean, it's about this plane that went missing for, like, five years. And they don't know where. And it's, like, into the glow and all this kind of stuff. And I'm very confused by a lot of stuff that happens and, and it like that. But, like, it, the writing and even the dialogue is so cheesy at times. But like, I'm obsessed with these characters. Like I have fallen in love with these characters and I really love just like the whole storyline of all of it. I'm really kind of sad that it's gonna be over after this season, but um, the girl that plays Michaela, she really reminds me of a very good friend of ours. And um, I think that's part of why I like watching it. But anyway, so I'm excited about that. I found out that that was out last night. So I was like, oh, I've got something I can watch over the weekend. And then I was, looking at something online, I can't remember, some celebrity was taking their kids to it, it might have been Tori Spelling, was taking their kids to the premiere of Cruel Summer, and I was like, is this the new season of the show that I just watched, Cruel Summer, which was about the girl that was kidnapped? Because I knew they were coming out with a new season that was gonna have, like, it was gonna be kind of the same feeling, if that makes sense, same, like, eeriness and, and weirdness, you know, but, and craziness, but, like, not the same storyline, not the same characters. And I was like, is this the new season? So I looked it up online and the new season premieres on Monday. I think it's on Freeform. So I was really excited about that. And I was like, okay, that's another show that I have that's coming out. And then this woman that I was talking to at the pool, we were talking about shows. I could kind of tell we didn't really like the same kind of shows because she was recommending to me all these shows that like, I just don't think are my thing. But she was like, I'm telling you right now, she's like, you have to watch Succession. She's like, have you watched any of it? I was like, no. And she's like, well, it's a dark comedy. She was like, but I think you would really, really like it. And I was like, okay. You know, it's funny because like, when people ask me for show recommendations, I always say to them, what are shows that you like, right? So if somebody said to me, like, well, I love shows like Grace and Frankie, and you know, I would try to find shows that are similar to that to recommend. But I feel like m most of the time when people recommend shows to you, what they recommend are shows that they love. And I, and I try to steer away from that because, you know, it's like, we all have our personal favorites, but that doesn't mean that somebody else is going to love the same shows as us, you know, and whatever. And, um, you know, like, Tanya and I even do that with each other. Like, Tanya will be like, oh, my God, you would love this show. Like, I, like I've been on her about watching St. X and Caroline, too. And Tanya was watching St. X, and so she was real into it. And we both talked about how we ugly cried at the end of it and stuff like that. And Caroline's like, I'm just I'm not really into this show at all. And I'm like, well, and Caroline and I usually really like the same shows, but she's just not into that. And I, I'm like, okay, we'll just don't watch it then, you know, watch something else. I do want to watch Firefly Lane. That's the other thing on Netflix that I want to watch. And then there's a couple other things that are coming out. My friend was like shooting me all these true crime documentaries to watch. I was like, okay, I cannot keep up with all of this. <laughs> you recommended to me that curious case of Natalia Grace and I got like down the rabbit hole of all that stuff. Then I'm like Googling all this stuff. Like where is she today? What happened to the parents and all this kind of stuff. And, um, it's, the whole thing is so weird, you guys. Like, even, oh, is this my Piata that's approaching? Yep, it is. Like, 
it even part of it even takes place in Seymour, Indiana, which is where my ex is from, which is we used to spend a lot of time down there, which is like so crazy. They always drive by my house. So like, we have our mailbox that has our address on it, but we also have like this like electric like pole stick thing that has the address of the house like next to us on it. And people always get confused about like which house is which. Let me get this. Be right back. How are you? Good. Fine. How are you? Good. Thank you so much. Yeah, man. Good. Here you go. Hey, can I say? Have a good evening. You too. So there is my Piata. So excited about it. Um, I should probably take it inside in just a second so I can put my sandwich in the fridge, but I'll do that in just a second. But anyway, look at my hair. My hair's kind of like swooping over a little bit. I have a hair appointment. I think this upcoming week I have a hair appointment. I don't know what day it's on. That can't be right. I thought it was on the 10th, but that's next Saturday. And I, I think my appointment is like in the middle of the week sometime, like Wednesday or Thursday or something. I'll have to look at that. I know we have couples counseling on Monday and then my meeting on Tuesday. And do I have therapy, individual therapy this week or do I have it the following week? I've got it all written down in my calendar on <laughs> site. So yeah, so today has been a good day and um, I ordered some, I, I looked online last night and I googled non-habit forming sleep supplements to help me sleep and I like read all these articles about like which ones are like the safest to take and which ones don't have like crazy supplements in it and stuff like that and so I ordered two things to take and actually one of the things that I, I ordered just and I know that I've said on here that it doesn't work for me and it does the opposite but I used to take it back in the day melatonin and I think when I took it I was taking 10, 10 milligrams and 10 milligrams worked for me and so I ordered some sleep aid they're supposed to come tomorrow and then I also ordered melatonin 10 milligrams because I thought well, I, even if it doesn't work, I mean, it's only like $9.99. It can't be any worse than this crap that I was taking that I ended up throwing out. Because I was like, I'm done with this. Like, this is not, I, I took it two nights in a row. It didn't work. It made me stay up away, you know. So even if I take the melatonin and it doesn't work, well, then I'll just, you know, Alex can take it or something. Because it, it, melatonin does work for Alex. So he can have it and he can take it and whatever. But I was like, I've got to have something because I'm like literally tossing and turning all night long in bed. And it was really interesting, like, some of the articles that I was reading were saying, I feel like I need to, like, you guys are already, like, at the, almost at the end of the table, but I feel like I need to bring you in closer. I don't know why. But it was interesting because a lot of these products, like, don't have magnesium in it. And they specifically say, like, no magnesium. And I was like, okay, but everybody's telling me that mag magnesium is, like, good for, like, a lot of them will say, like, no melatonin, and a lot of them will say no magnesium. And I was like, okay, this is interesting to me, like why are these products specifically saying no magnesium? Like I understand like the melatonin cause maybe like people are having the same reaction that I do. Like melatonin like does the opposite for them or something like that, right? So I was looking at these articles and, and what I found was that a lot of people have very similar reactions like I have been having to sleep products that have magnesium in it. It like does the opposite for them. It keeps them up, it keeps them awake. Which, I mean, and probably, to be honest with you, the melatonin won't help me either. Probably neither one of these sleep aids I get will help me. Really, the only thing that has helped me in, like, the last six months has been Sleepy Time Tea, which is just, like, chamomile and lavender. Like, I don't even know. It's probably all just in my head. You know, it's psychosomatic that it works. But I've got to have something because I literally, like, go to sleep and I just toss and turn and toss and turn and toss and turn and toss and turn for, like, two hours. Like, it's horrible. And um, and I'm just, like, not getting, like, great sleep. And 
And then the other problem is, is that when I do finally go to sleep, like Alex wakes up like an hour, hour and a half later to get ready for work. And so then I have to fall back asleep all over again. And, um, and, and that's hard, you know? And so I seem to fall asleep easier the second time. Like I wouldn't say it's like, I'm, you know, put my head down and I fall asleep, but it seems to be easier for me than other times that I try to go to sleep. Even like recently when I've been like laying down just to like take a nap while he's watching a show or something. Um, like I can't fall asleep. Like last night he was watching Queen Charlotte. He was finishing that. And I was like, I'm going to lay down for like an hour and a half because I want to get up and I want to watch these shows. And he was like, okay. And I laid down and I tossed and turned and tossed and turned. And then I woke up and I just kind of like sat there. He was watching the last episode of Queen Charlotte and I just kind of watched it with him and then cried my eyes out at the end because I love that show so much. The last episode is so beautiful. The party from the part of the, the last party on is like my favorite. Like I love that. And I actually downloaded, um, I don't think this will ruin it for anybody if you haven't watched Queen Charlotte, but like, you know, they do covers of like popular songs, but they have like the orchestra play it. So they did a cover at the very end of I Will Always Love You by Whitney Houston or Dolly Parton. And they did a cover of it where the orchestra plays it. And it's a beautiful scene in the show. And so I got online and they have Queen Charlotte, all of the covers that you can buy. I'm sure they have it for Bridgerton too. And so... Here it is, right here, I have it up. And so I bought all of the covers last night. If I Ain't Got You, I Will Always Love You. A Feeling I've Never Been, Halo, Deja Vu, Run the World, Nobody Gets Me. Queen Charlotte, a Bridgerton story cover from Netflix series. It's actually produced by Alicia Keys. Yeah, but I love that. If you haven't seen, if you, well, the thing is, if you haven't watched Bridgerton, I don't know how much sense Queen Charlotte would make to you. Like, you kind of have to watch Bridgerton because there's a lot of like backstory. But and you have to have seen both seasons of Bridgerton. There's like a lot of backstory with like Lady Danbury and Violet Bridgerton and the Queen and like how they interact and they know each other. Like if you haven't watched Bridgerton, like Queen Charlotte probably won't make a lot of sense to you. I mean, it will still make sense because it's a story on its own about Queen Charlotte and the King King George and like their relationship. But like the background story of all of it references a lot to do with Bridgerton and. Um, like kind of the history of Bridgerton. I just love that whole world. I think it's fantastic. Somebody corrected me and I didn't know this because I thought Shonda Rhimes had written all of those. But apparently they're books that Shonda Rhimes like based the um, story on. Somebody on the vlog, like I mentioned that a while ago, somebody said, oh no, no, Shonda Rhimes didn't come up with this. These were books. And I didn't know that Bridgerton was a book. I might look into reading it at some point. If like there's a lot of books in the series or something like that, I might look into reading it. But maybe not. That's actually one of my goals for tonight. I told Alex, I said, we'll watch RuPaul's Drag Race um, while I'm eating. And then I said, I'm going to lay down for a little bit. He's like, I don't care. He's like, I'm relaxing the whole weekend. He's like, that's all I plan to do is relax this weekend. I'm tired. And he was like, I need to relax. He's like, I have no plans this weekend. We talked about watching um, the Scream movie. And then he also mentioned maybe possibly going to The Little Mermaid. So we might do that this weekend. Um, and seeing that, but I don't know when we'll do that. Um, hold on a second. I have my phone on. So when I like do Q&As or if I'm looking at receipts in my phone... I set the display and brightness auto lock to never so that my phone doesn't turn off so I can get into stuff easily. But then I forget to turn it off and then it like drains my phone. So I have to go in there and like turn that off. But anyway, I just had this overwhelming feeling while I was doing that. I was like, I feel so calm and relaxed. It is just such a beautiful evening. I want to show you guys like it's just such a beautiful evening outside. It's like so summery and sunny and it's just so pretty outside and it's so nice and so warm. I'm so happy that I've been to the pool a couple days already. Um, 
Yeah, I've been to, the pool's been open four days, and I've been to the pool already three days, three out of the four days. And I plan to go tomorrow, and I plan to go to Sunday. Like, today, I didn't even plan to go that long. I was like, well, I'm just going to run up there with the neighbor, because Alex was, I, he didn't want to go. And so I was like, well, I'm just going to run up there with the neighbor and, like, take a quick dip in the pool and, you know, get out, and I'll be back. I really thought I'd only be up there for, like, 15 or 20 minutes. Because it's later in the, when it's later in the day, there's not typically tons of people up there. And so I was like, well, I'm just going to, like, you know, go up there real quick, and then I'll be back. He's like, okay, babe. I mean, I sure didn't plan to be up there for like an hour and 45 minutes, which I ended up, I mean, I start talking and then I just kind of can't shut up. It's so funny because I get a lot of questions from people and they'll say, like, how did you overcome your social anxiety to talk to your neighbors and to talk to people and whatever? I don't really know. You know, I have to say, like, with strangers... Okay, I don't know if this will make sense. Like, sitting on my front porch or going to the pool and talking to a complete stranger, like, about a book they're reading, and, like, saying, oh, like, oh, I read that book that I was telling this woman today, like, she was reading this book, and we were talking about, like, reading and shows and whatever. Like, I don't really have a problem with that. Like, that's never really been something that's hard for me. Now, if there were 30 people at the pool, I would have a hard time talking to her. It's going to like parties, it's going to events where there's a lot of people that I feel like all eyes are on me and people are watching me that I feel like I'm gonna put my foot in my mouth or I'm gonna say something that's stupid. And I think that stems a lot from me like growing up and going to school and people making fun of me. Like I would say something and people would be like, eh, 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 and they would like make fun of me of how I said it or how I moved or whatever. So if it's like one-on-one -on -one with somebody, like a neighbor walking by or a neighbor talking to me, like, that's very safe to me. It's when I'm in a big setting of, like, a lot of people that I start getting nervous and I kind of go inside a little bit. But when it's just one other person, like, I don't really have a hard time with that. Like, Alex always jokes. He's like, you know, like, when we go to, you know, on a trip or whatever, we're sitting on the beach or at the pool or whatever, like, I'll talk to the person next to us. Like, I don't have a problem doing that. Like, I don't have a problem, like, saying to somebody, like, oh, I like your nail polish. Or, like, oh, I read that book, too. Or, you know, whatever. Or, like, I can remember... This couple that we met from Austin that we become friends with, um, talking to her because she was reading a Colleen Hoover book. And so I was asking her, I was like, can you explain to me what the draw is with Colleen Hoover? And she was like, oh my God, I just love all of her books and blah, 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 whatever. She said something like that. I can't remember. She read a couple of her books or something. And um, so that was kind of how I started talking to her. And... Um, but if it's, like, in a big setting, like, a party or something like that, where I feel like a lot of people are, like, watching me, like, then I get very nervous and I kind of put my head down and I don't really talk to a lot of people unless people talk to me. Or if I'm sitting, like, if I go to a party and, like, I get on a couch and there's, like, two people on either, like, there's a person on either side of me, that feels very safe to me, especially if it's somebody that I know. Like, I can have, like, an intimate conversation with them. And then I don't really care who comes into this. But, like, I couldn't... I just don't love like large gatherings. They make me very, very nervous, and they always have. Um, like I wouldn't go to like a movie theater and like turn around and talk to somebody like three rows back. Like that would make me nervous, you know. Like um, even if I was like, I don't know. I just like big social situations like make me very, very nervous. But smaller situations, and maybe it's because I feel like I can kind of control the outcome a little bit or whatever. Like. That doesn't make me as nervous. Um, just because, like I said, like I can kind of, you know, like control like the conversation a little bit or the outcome. It doesn't seem as scary to me as like going to a situation like back in the day when, you know, like we would go to like a birthday party or a Halloween party or something like that. And I was like, uh, like I would have to be like, I can remember when I first started doing that stuff, like my friend Aaron, she used to always throw Halloween parties every year. And that was like the first big thing that I did was go to this Halloween party. And I can remember we got there early enough that I was like one of the first people there. And I just kind of stood in the kitchen with my back up against the sink. And so when people would come, come in, they would just be like, oh, hey, how are you? And I'd be like, I'm good. And they'd be like, you know, I'm Judy. And I'd be like, I'm Peter. It's nice to meet you and whatever, you know. And it felt very safe to me because I kind of was, I was already there, you know? Um, and then I had such a good time that like that, having that good time helped me for future situations of being like, okay, you did it last time. You had a great time. You don't want to miss out. You can do it again. Um, so that's kind of helped me over time, but I still do have lots of situations where I feel like rev that we went to like i really had to like work myself up 
to going like walking through there and being like come, I was like you know like nervous like who am I gonna see like blah 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 whatever you know like really having to work myself up a little bit which I think like going this year and wearing something that was so like casual and comfortable for me like really really helped because sometimes when I'm dressed in things that are not comfortable um like I, I'm just I don't feel myself I don't feel comfortable and so like I think that was like a really good choice for me okay this is almost at the 30 minute mark so I'm gonna go put my food inside and I will be right back Okay, I'm back. I was just putting my street corn and the sandwich in the fridge and I yelled up to Alex. I said, I got street corn. It's like the world's smallest street corn. And I said, they done screwed me. He goes, they done screwed me. I go, well, they did. And I said, it's like this little cup. It's like so small. I'm not happy about it. I was real excited about the street corn. But anyway, it'll still be good. I'm sure it'll be delicious. So, you know, it's interesting talking about the social anxiety because... Like, growing up, when I was with, like, my parents or family friends or, like, my aunt and uncle or, like, my aunt in Fort Wayne and stuff like that, I was, like, such an exuberant young kid, always wanting to entertain, always wanting to put on a show, a talent show or a puppet show or something like that. I was always, like, really wanting to entertain, you know, sing a song, dance, all this kind of stuff. But, like, at school, I kind of shut down. And it happened very early to me. I mean, it happened like, I mean, I've shared the story on here before about, you know, when the kids like in first grade were making, kindergarten or first grade were making fun of me about the homogenous milk and don't drink the milk because it'll make you a homo like Peter and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, it's interesting because people say things to me like, well, that happened so long ago. Like you still let this bother you. And it's not like, every day all day like I think about this stuff you know it's not like all day I think oh god I was bullied and like whatever but it is interesting to me about like how these defense mechanisms or these defensive tactics that I developed over time to deal with that kind of stuff you know of like keeping your head down don't draw attention to yourself stay quiet don't say anything. Don't move a lot. I mean, you think about that as kids, okay? I mean, like, kids from six years old till 14 or 15 are, I mean, you know. So you have to think about the whole time I'm thinking to myself, don't, don't speak real loud because people will hear how you speak, how you sound. Um, don't bring attention to yourself. Don't move a lot. Like on the playground, like don't run because somebody will make fun of how you're running. You know, your hands are out this way or you look girly or what. I mean, it, I, I watched every move that I made, right? Well, that becomes so constrictive like over, that's like the second or third time I've used that word today. I used it in my drama video too. But that becomes so constrictive over time that it's like you almost do not have the ability to be yourself whereas other kids are running on soccer fields and being themselves and whatever and you know I think one of the reasons why I played tennis for so long was a because I was naturally good at it and b because because I was so good at it and I and I was doing really well that nobody was really making fun of me at tennis you know and so it wasn't like, I mean, if I was beating somebody, you know, 6-0 or something like that, that they were sitting there calling me names. They weren't, you know? I mean, so I think that was one of the reasons why I kept up with it for so long. And and then at home, like in my neighborhood, and I, I look back on that, I don't know why that happened. I don't know if, like, my neighbors were saying to their kids, hey, how are you? Beautiful, isn't it? Now, I have not seen you at the pool yet. Yeah, I haven't been. You got to get up there. Do you do it every day? I've been up there three times already. Maybe Today, the water was actually really nice. Okay. I think it was 78, the water said. Okay. Um, so, I met her a couple years ago when she was up at the pool. She just moved in here. And she really wanted to get a dog, like a rescue dog. And so, like, I hooked her up with Melissa. And she actually got this, like, King Cavalier. Is that... 
those dogs are called. It's so cute. And it's like three years old and she's like so happy now because she like, her husband had passed away and so she moved into the neighborhood and she's like, I'm just kind of like really lonely. Like I want to get a dog. And now she walks this dog like three or four times a day and he is the cutest dog in the world. But anyway, and she's real sweet. We read a lot of the same books so we always like talk about books when we're at the pool. But um, he's just going and going and going. <laughs> he's pulling you. Um, but you know, like, oh, here's another neighbor walking out so I can hear him talking to her. He's like, you smell good too, to the dog. Um, what was I going to say? I remember what I was talking about, but I don't remember specifically what I was talking about. I kind of like lost my mind. Alex calls it get, getting stuck. Like when you, like, do you ever do that where you're like looking at something and you're just like, <laughs> Alex and his friends call it getting stuck. And it's so funny because like I'll be like in bed and like I'll just like be looking at Boo Radley and I'll be like, <laughs> he'll be like, are you stuck? Come on, are you stuck? I'm stuck. I'm stuck. Do you ever do that? <laughs> when you just kind of like look off into space and you're like, it's actually really pleasant, isn't it? Um, you know, I think like... And so it's interesting to me, like when people say to me like, get over it, you know, this happened so long ago and whatever. Well, I mean, the truth be told, I'm 51, I'm gonna be 51 years old this month, right? And I have to say that as forgiving of a person as I am, it's understanding that I understand that kids are kids and whatever. It's like, I'm not resentful at the people that did it to me. I'm not resentful, whatever. I'm more resentful kind of like today at the situation, just in general, whatever. We can blame everybody for everything, right? But like, I'm just resentful at the fact that like, I wasn't able to be fully myself when I wanted to be. Like, I sometimes wonder like, who would I have turned out? Like, like, I heard these parents today, they were talking about these schools here in town and like um, this one mom that I know that her son was at the pool, whose mom lives here in this neighborhood, she was telling me, or she was telling this other woman, and she goes like the coolest the private school here in town. And she was t talking about it and just like how liberal it is and how like artsy it is. And you know, it's just like, I mean, it's like, it's like top cool school here. I mean, like everybody wants their kids to go. There's like a waiting list and all this kind of stuff. And, um, and so, you know, I think about that sometimes, like, I wonder what my experience would have been like, had I gone to a school like that, or if I had gone, if I had been in an environment where I could have just been like whoever I wanted to be, you know, and didn't feel ashamed or, because there was shame that went along with that, you know, of like running around and even just like how I held my hands or because people would make fun of that or you know like crossing my legs or god forbid you wear a pink shirt you know or a certain color I mean back then like in the 80s like that was a big deal you know boys don't wear yellow boys don't wear pink boys don't wear light green you know and that was all a big deal and so if you do something one thing wrong you're you're screwed you know and it's like I felt like I was always doing something that was wrong. Like, you know, there was actually an Indigo Girl song and in it, she says something about, I think it's the song Least Complicated and she says something about, like I always was doing something like, exactly like that. Like I was always doing what was, you know, the, the not the right thing to do, you know? And that's how I felt growing up. It was like, no matter what I did, I felt like I was doing the wrong thing and people were calling it out and people were noticing it. And when it was just like wearing a yellow shirt, you know, that I thought like I looked pretty nice in, you know? And then I would come to school and everybody would be like, you have a yellow shirt on, are you a girl? Like, why are you wearing a yellow shirt, you know? Or why do you walk like that? When I didn't even think there was anything wrong with how I walked, you know? And 
And so I wasn't fully able to be myself because I was so conscious of every move that I made, of everything that I did. And it was such a dichotomy because when I was at home, like, I could be whoever I wanted to be. Oh, that was what I was going to say. I don't know to this day, like, if my neighbors, because out of protection of me or because they were just good people or because they were friends with my mom and dad or whatever, but that they would say, you know, you include Peter in everything. You're not mean to him. You don't say anything mean to him. And I don't know if, like, just in the neighborhood they didn't say anything different about it. I mean... My, me and my two girlfriends, like, we ran all over the neighborhood, you know? I mean, popping our gum and all this kind of... And I was feathering my hair with my comb. And, I mean, nobody was saying anything. The boys didn't care. The boys didn't say anything. And one second, you know, I'd be running bases, playing baseball in the cul-de-sac. And they'd include me on that. And the next second, you know, I was feathering my hair and, you know, doing cheers on the side. And nobody said anything. And at home, I was able to be myself. But at school, it was such a completely different world, you know? And, um... I remember I talked to my nephew Carlitos about this probably a year ago. I said to him something about, because he's kind of like a popular kid in a school. And I said to him, I said, like, I asked him, I said, you know, are there kids that are bullied at your school? And he said, yeah. And, and I said, do you participate? Like, are you, do you bully them? And he goes, no, I don't do that. Which, I mean, I, who knows? I don't know, right? And I thought... I didn't really know what to say in that moment. And I said to him, I said, you know, I said, your T.O. Peter was really bullied when I was growing up. Like, people made a lot of fun of, fun of me, you know? And I said, and it really, really hurt me. And I said, and I was scared to go to school, and I didn't want to go to school and things like that. And I said, you know, the thing you could do is reach out to those people and be their friend. You know, it's like you don't know what to even say in those situations. You know what I mean? But, like, um... You know, and I look at him and he's like going to go in, he's going into fifth grade and he's so little, you know, and I think, when I think back on fifth grade, like those people had so much power over me, you know, I mean, and they still, to this day, I think about that, you know, and it's like crazy to me that that's impacted me my whole life. Like those people aren't thinking about it today. Like those people aren't thinking about, you know, the fact that for years they had to watch every move they made because they were afraid of being, you know, criticized for it or whatever. And um, Alex is in the kitchen. He's probably looking in my bag and he's going to see a special surprise. <laughs> but anyway. I don't know. I wish I could take a magic wand or snap my finger and just be like, okay, it never happened. I was never affected by it. But the reality is, and listen, and I am very aware that there are people out there, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people that went through 10 times worse childhood trauma that I ever went through, okay? If me being called some names and being bullied in school was the worst that I went through, and it was very manageable for me, and I am so thankful that I came from two loving parents that loved me unconditionally no matter what. I am so thankful that I had aunts and uncles and friends and the family that loved me no matter what. I'm so thankful that I was able to be myself in my neighborhood, you know, and nobody questioned that. I feel so grateful for that, that I had an aunt that made me pay paper wedding dresses, you know what I mean? And we sang Tammy Wynette and Dolly Parton. Like, I, I'm so grateful for all of that because I think that it kind of, to some degree, balanced itself out. And I think that had I not had that if at home, because I do, you know, know that there are a lot of people out there whose home environments are just as toxic as their school environments, right? Or maybe their school is their safe haven, you know? I can't imagine what I would have been like if school was hell, but home was hell as well. You know, if I had had a mom or a dad that was like, well, you never, you better never be one of those gay kids or you better never try. I mean, if I had had that coming home, like, I don't know what. I already had, like, so much shame associated with what kids were saying that I didn't want to be what they were saying, you know. But at the same time, I so wanted, I, I fought that because I so wanted to be myself and just sing out loud, you know. It's like in that Al Pacino movie, it's like, you know, I can't remember what the movie's called, but it's with, uh, Oh, what's the guy that passed away a couple years ago? Guy who was such a great actor, character actor. I can't think of his name. It's like three names. But anyway, sing out, Louise, he says, you know, from um, Gypsy Rose Lee. 
that movie and um why can't I think of his name but anyway you know it's like I think I fought that so hard of just like wanting to be myself you know but I was always so quiet even through like all through high school you know I was so quiet like I would never fight back I would never speak back and whatever and the few moments that I did blew up in my face like the few moments I stood up for myself like blew up in my face so it was like well what's the point there's no point in defending myself because nobody's gonna have my back nobody's gonna you know whatever except for my girlfriends and it blew up in their faces too you know so it was like what's the point um but you know I look back on that and I think you know people want to talk about formative years and all this kind of stuff um and I went through 20 years of hell of course even at 50 years old it's still going to affect me but if I could take a magic wand or if I could you know snap my fingers and I can't snap today have it all just like go away and not affect me today? Absolutely I would. You think I want to continue to talk about it or have it continue to affect me? No. But what's so interesting is I find myself in situations where it's like something will be said or something will happen and it like takes me right back to it. There were a few years ago when I was in a meeting and um, this guy that I would not say is one of my friends, but he's probably 70 or something like that and you know I talk a lot with my hands when I talk I think we all know that right and I was sharing something like that and like I've made this very clear we do not cross talk in meetings when somebody gets done talking we don't like share directly to them or whatever right and I got done talking and I was you know just doing this or whatever and as soon as I got done talking it was not his turn he said something to me I don't even remember how he said it but I'm, I can just remember just like flush turning red and I felt like I was five years old again in school and people were making fun of me and he said why do you talk so much with your hands he was like you need to sit on your hands when you talk he was like it's too much or something like that and I just was like I mean I felt so ashamed and so embarrassed and I just was like oh my god like I mean I was taken right back to when I was, you know, six, seven, five, six, seven years old again, you know, all the way through high school, of like that shame that I felt of somebody calling me out for being different or whatever. And the reality is, I'd love to tell you that I don't care, that it doesn't bother me when people say that stuff, but I think that what bothers me about it is it takes me back to those emotional wounds that I had all those years ago. And no, it doesn't happen as often as it did back then. It might only happen once a month or something like that, but it seems like there's often occurrences that something reminds me of what I went through back then. It just kind of like, it opens that back up again where I'm kind of like, oh, you know, like, oh gosh, like that hurts, like, you know? And the reality is, I think with whatever we go through as kids, you know, whether we go through neglect or abuse or bullying or whatever like I think I mean I think like even when you look at kids whose like parents were probably great parents right but pushed perfectionism on them of like you have to get these great grades you have to be um you know like top of your class you have to be you know class president you have to be like number one football player you have to be number one cheerleader all those kind of things like i mean you think those kids don't suffer too because i think they do right and i think they carry that into their adulthood where at 50 years old they're still trying to be these perfectionists where it's like everything they do in their life they're trying to get validation for that they're like a gold star you know what i mean not like gold stars <laughs> you guys know what a gold star is a gold star is like a gay guy that's never had sex with a woman but anyway or I guess it could apply to a lesbian, too, that's never had sex with a man. But anyway, um, but, you know, they're, they're trying to get, like, that A-plus validation from somebody. So it's, like, this stuff that happens to, our, to us in our childhood, like, it never really goes away. It's always going to be there with us. And I think the thing is, it's not about saying, well, just move on from it, just get over it. Like, you you at 50 years old shouldn't be dealing with this anymore. Like, every once in a while I get comments and people are like, I wish you weren't so caught up in the past. I wish you, you didn't talk about this stuff. I love telling stories of the past. I love telling stories about my mom and my dad and growing up. And, like, those, those things are enjoyable for me. Like, I love going down memory lane, you know? I even enjoy talking about this stuff because this stuff helps me. It's cathartic for me to understand better. Like when I'm talking just to the camera or to you or whatever, like I'm like processing it in my head. Like I'm like 
like it's making sense to me it's like it's kind of like to some degree like not therapy but like assignments of therapy like where i'm talking about it out loud you know i'm kind of like processing and whatever I don't know that I think the answer is ever to tell somebody to move on from it or, you know, I, I'm a believer in moving, we move through the pain and we carry it with us. Like my friend said to me when her son passed away, like she gave me that, you know, years later when I asked her about, you know, like people keep on saying to me, like, you just need to move on from like your mom and whatever. And she's like, no, we never move on. We, we move through the pain, but we carry it with us. And I believe that to be true. And I, I think, I honestly think it's ignorant to expect somebody to move on from what happened to them as a kid. I think that's a quick fix of, I think that's when people get uncomfortable because you talk about real issues that are still affecting you today and they don't, they don't like it and they don't know what to do with it and they don't know what to say. So their response to it is, you just need to move on from this. Like this is, you've been talking about this for so long. You've been, you've been talking about being bullied for years. You're 50 years old, move on, get over it. Right. Okay. Well, the reality is, you know, and that's why I think it meant so much to me when my therapist said to me, like, I believe that you've really suffered from some PTSD from being bullied. It was like the first time somebody validated for me what I had really gone through, you know? And so, because I'd never really heard that before. Nobody had really validated for me the seriousness of what I had gone through, ever, you know? And it was interesting because somebody said this to me on a comment on my video, and I've said this before, but like... I never told my parents what was going on. Like, I never told my mom and my dad the extent of what was going on until years later. My dad really didn't know what to do with it when I told him about it. Like, he was, like, hurt for me. My mom's response to it was, tell me who they are, and I'm going to go tell their parents what kind of kids they had, right? Like, that was my mom's response to it. The reason I didn't ever want my parents to know... And it was so interesting to me when I read this comment, because I was like, yep, that's exactly what I went through. Yep, that's exactly why I did it, Right? Because somebody said in, my, in the comment on the vlog, I never told my parents because I didn't want them to know what I went through every day. And that was exactly what I did. I never told my parents what I was going through because I never wanted my parents to, ex to have to, on some level, witness or experience what I was going through and think, my kid's getting bullied every day at school. Like, I think my dad had a kind of a pretty good idea of it, like, in retrospect and having talked to him many, many times about it. He just didn't know what to do with it, you know? Like, I mean, he even talked to sc the school about it. He talked to the dean and the principals, and then my dad stood up for me many times. But I don't think that he knew past that really what to do with it, of how to fix the solution, other than, like, move schools or whatever, you know? Like, today we have homeschooling. We move kids to different, you know, schools, things like that. But, like, that wasn't really, a, like, an option back then, you know? And so... And if it was, like, we didn't really talk about it, and that wasn't, a, that wasn't a viable option for me, you know? Like, I don't remember anybody talking to me about, like, maybe they did. I don't really remember it today, but, um, but, you know, like, I didn't want my mom, especially my mom, I think, because I knew she would hurt so bad for me. Like, I didn't want her to know like what I went through and I can remember and I shared this in a note on Facebook. This was like one of the very first things I ever did on Facebook was like, it was like 25 things people never knew about me in high school and people were like doing it. And so I did it. And the last thing I put on there, which was why my bully ended up reaching out to me and we ended up making up and having coffee and all this kind of stuff. The last thing I put on there was I did not want to walk across the straight stage at graduation out of fear that somebody was going to call me the F word. And then my mom would know in that moment everything I experienced all through high school. I was terrified of walking across the straight stage at graduation. I did not want to do it because I was afraid she's going to hear. I wasn't afraid about it for me. I had been called it for 12 years. I was afraid that in that moment, my mom's proudest moment of seeing her son walk across the graduation stage that she was gonna know what I had experienced for 12 years. And I couldn't handle my mom dealing with that. I was so, too protective of her, you know? But I think that instead of telling people to move on from it, and instead of telling people, it's been 30 years, get over it. It's been 40 years, like you're not a kid anymore, or whatever, right? Like we're talking about foundation development years when people are growing into becoming adults. And these things that they're learning of watch every movement, you know, don't bring attention to yourself, be quiet. I mean, those are all things you carry into your adulthood, right? I think instead of telling people to move on, 
Instead, we should encourage people to talk about those experiences, share with other people, well, maybe this is what we can do to help other people today that are going through that, and also say, okay, so what's the defense against that, you know, because so that I don't continue to be a victim. Like, I, I think that's where, like, Oprah's definition of forgiveness really, really helps me, where she says, you know, that, like, you accept the past for what happened, not that what happened was okay. You're not saying what happened was okay, but you're accepting that it happened so that you can move on from that and not be held hostage to your past. I don't want to be held hostage to the things that happened to me when I was 15 years old or 12 years old or 8 years old or 6 years old, right? And so I have to look at it in its face and be accepting of it and say, but it happened. And I can't hide from that. I can't act like it didn't happen and be like, get over it. It is what it is. You're 50 years old now. Move on. You're going to be 51. It's not that big of a deal, right? Like, acknowledge it and realize that that is just as much a part of me as the good things are, too. And maybe in some ways, what I went through made me a stronger person, made me a more empathetic person, made me a more caring person, made me a more understanding person of other people's situations. Maybe, just maybe, something positive came out of all of that. I hope. I hope. Because to harbor anger in my heart and to just continue to just go on and on and on about this story of being bullied for 12 years, like, what's the point at the end, you know? Like, there has to be something that I've learned through all of this. And I believe that there has. And I talk a lot about it with my counselor, you know? I mean, I, we don't, I don't sit there and talk to my counselor about, like, well, when I was six years old, like, I mean, we don't do that, right? But, like, when stuff comes up and somebody says something to me and I'm like, okay, this is a reminder of what happened to me you know, when I was like in third grade, sure, like I do bring that up and talk to him again. He's like, okay, and what was the feeling attached to it? What was the emotion that you had that attached when that happened? Fear is usually the first one. What were you afraid of? You know, and then we process through that and then that helps me come out on the other side and take a look at it and go, wow, like that's really powerful. You know, and oh, and isn't this interesting that I'm continuing to choose to live my life this way, even when those things aren't occurring, that fear is still there, right? And so it helps me better understand who I am today. But to act like it just didn't occur and to move on, I think that is not helping anybody. You know, I think you have to acknowledge the pain that you went through, whatever you went through. And work through it, you know, which is why I'm so encouraging of people in therapy because that's where you process through, you know. It's like where I take things to my sponsor and she's like, well, this is where you need outside help. Like, we can talk about the resentment. We can talk about how it affected your life. But, like, you need to talk about it on a deeper level with your therapist who's trying to talk about these things. Like, you know, recovery is not – like, 12-step programs are not going to help everything, right? And so that's where I take these things to him, you know. And yes, it doesn't come up as much as it used to, but it still comes up from time to time. You know, it still affects me. So anyway, I don't even know how I got into all that, but I'm going to go inside and I'm going to watch RuPaul's Drag Race with my husband, <laughs> with my pride cup. <laughs> and um, so, yeah, anyway. And, you know, and thankfully enough, like, on the flip side of this, I live such a happy life today, you know, and I feel so blessed to have such a wonderful husband and a dog and a little family and a little house with little flowers on the front porch and neighbors that I love to talk to. Like I have, the flip side of that is, okay, but you know what? You made it through and you're still here and you're still thriving and you have an amazing life as a result of it. And isn't that cool, you know? That's the flip side of that. So, all right, you guys, I'm going to get off here now. So I hope that you guys are having a magically amazing Friday and a fantastic beginning to your weekend. And if nobody else has told you this today, I love you. And remember these three very important things. One, you can start your day over whenever you want. Two, practice random acts of kindness. And three, most importantly, make sure that you reach out to somebody and let them know how much they mean to you. Because like I always say, you might be putting a smile on their face. You might be cheering them up. You might be making them happy. And you might be just making their day. You don't know. And also, remember to be kinder to one another. Love one another a little bit more. And most importantly, be kinder and love yourselves a little bit more. Because what? It all starts with you. And I love you guys. And I'll see you tomorrow. Bye. Love ya.